um, technically, I suppose we're competitors, but um, one of the things that we both love about the stormwater industry, the business that we're in, is that there's there's so much work um, in maintenance, and each of us develops you know unique um, experience and specialties so that we can help each other um, to achieve compliance for property owners. Um, so I asked Ryan, he immediately said no, and I had to bribe him. But anyway, that's why we're doing this together. He's here now. Um, and I also wanted to thank Hamilton Township. I think this is fantastic that they're offering uh, these um, workshops because so many property owners don't know much about stormwater um, facilities and stormwater maintenance. So I think this is outstanding. Um, so thank you. Yeah, we there's not a lot of um, townships like yourselves that are taking this initiative to give this information to property owners. And we were delighted when we heard that you guys are doing this, that we had a chance to speak. And we're also very thankful you guys did invite us to do this. Okay. Oh, man. I, I, I thank you for your time and <laughs> your knowledge on this as well. Appreciate it. All right. All right. So what we want to cover today um, is, you know, although we will fo focus mainly on maintenance, we do want to talk a little bit about um, the selection of stormwater facilities for a property um, and what that impact is um, and, and how you should think about maintenance, how maintenance really should drive um, the selection of a stormwater facility. Um, we'll also talk about um, the guidelines. And, and I'm not sure that everyone knows where to find stormwater guidelines. And of course, I can't see your faces. So I'm going to assume that maybe you don't. If you don't know where the guidelines are for the stormwater facility that you have installed on your property, but you do have either the construction drawings or the as-built drawings for your property, um, they typically cut and paste, the engineer will have cut and pasted um, some maintenance guidelines, some O&M requirements um, toward the back of the, the document. They're called post-construction stormwater management um, plan documents. So that's one source to find it. Um, the second would be if you have a specially device installed, um, like a, a stormwater filtering system, you can go to the manufacturer um, to their website and download their maintenance guidelines um, for that particular device. And then, of course, you can go to the township. Township's going to tell you what you need to do. Um, or you can go to um, New Jersey. Uh, the Department of Environmental Protection has a very robust stormwater pro program. And in fact, a lot of the guidelines um, adopted by manufacturers and townships come from um, the New Jersey DEP. So they're a great source um, for getting them. Um, we will talk about incorporating existing structures. You know, anytime a property redevelops, you know, a lot of times you're stuck with older structures um, and they do have uh, more maintenance. Um, they tend to have more, more maintenance um, activities than newer structures that are going to last longer and are going to require less, um, less maintenance. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, just general uh, maintenance programs, about scheduling, about what to anticipate um, for your type of stormwater facility. And then we'll talk a little bit about budgeting for, for maintenance. So the first one, yes. Yeah, so um, again, even selecting um, a stormwater facility for the property, um, you really have to take maintenance into account. First would be the cost. I mean, not just the cost of installing that stormwater facility, but also the cost of long-term maintenance for it. And some facilities that may be less costly to install could have higher long-term maintenance costs. So you definitely want to um, understand what those are in advance um, of, you know, prior to construction, prior to and during engineering, prior to construction. Um, the second would be the location. Mm -hmm not just the location of the stormwater facilities themselves, but also the location of the property. You know, are you on a highway? Um, is there a lot of sunshine as opposed to shade? Um, is there a lot of trash? Do you have a lot of pedestrian traffic? Um, the, you know, the, if it's a manufacturing site, is it, it, are they manufacturing things that are, you know, where the, you've got a lot of debris and sediment um, being created? Um, Right, I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything else. But the, you know, th things like that. You have to really think through what goes. Where is the property located? What goes on on the property? Um, in in selecting, selecting the stormwater facility and then in maintaining it. 
Yeah, so just like Kate said, you can see the bottom here, it says expectations. And then if you look at the picture right here, as you can see that guardrail for the shopping carts is set up and that would be not a mistake per se, but that's very hard for us to maintain it and to inspect it because there's gonna be shopping carts on top of it. The location isn't that prime for that spot. Yeah, I agree. And accessibility, um, I mean, that, mm -hmm. that touched on accessibility. Same thing with like manholes. If you've got a manhole that's located in a parking stall, there's a good chance there's going to be a, a car parked on it uh, at the time that inspection is due or, uh, you know, providers there um, to perform maintenance, they're never going to get to it. So the manholes, you're much better off putting them in a drive lane as opposed to, say, permeable concrete. Um, you don't want that in the drive lane if you can avoid it. But the parking stalls, um, you know, where there's less traffic, it, you know, is a better option. Mm -hmm. And obviously with construction, you're not always going to be able to do that. You're not always going to be able to put the things where you'd like to have them. And that's why it's really important for the property owners to know where these things are at. So when inspections and maintenance do come up, they can plan ahead, put cones off, block out areas. So there is some accessibility. Right. Um, the other thing about the expectations, I was thinking um, in terms of green infrastructure or vegetated um, stormwater facilities, um, a lot of people prefer a more manicured look than um, what a lot of naturalized stormwater facilities end up being. So it's, um, you know, on paper, it might look like something that would be appealing to a property owner, but maybe they, um, they don't recognize um, how it's how it's going to be once it once mm -hmm. it you know fully grows out and becomes a habitat for for birds and um and insects All right right so here we have one size doesn't fit all and you can see that maintenance tax and frequency it always depends on what you actually have installed for your stormwater and just what your what your property is what your site looks like you know is it a heavy traffic site is it not heavy traffic site maybe being more like a shopping center that has a lot of cars going into it or a, a company that has a lot of trucks going in and out of it that can you know create a lot of trash sediment erosion things like that so the, 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 the part of the, the so one of the things for the size doesn't fit all is that you have the biovegetation infiltration or retention, which would be something more or less that you're seeing in this picture right here, where there could be a lot of overgrowth, there could be a lot of erosion sediment that could fall into it to the bottom. And it, that's why it's, it's not one size fits all. You're going to have a lot of different maintenance tasks and a lot of different inspections just depending on what you have you can have an underground system that would be um like a basin underneath your parking lot which is where you have inspections with inside inlets manholes you know, control systems where you're looking at more of the pipes where you have to do pipe inspections you could do jetting and you could do different things like that where if you have a high traffic area where a lot of trash getting to the inlets that's going to be a more frequent depending on that compared to where you have something like this where you're going to be looking at more of the slopes. You're going to be looking at where the rainwater falls, if it erodes a lot more, if it's corroding, if trash piles up in the bottom of it. One of the things for these is that if you have sediment over time in the bottom, that can affect the grade. So are we looking at, is there a lot of cert, uh, dirt and silt going into the bottom of it? Is that going to change things? Is that going to create a problem where, where a lot of these are designed to infiltrate into the ground? And if it doesn't infiltrate to the ground and there's ponding, they can snowball on each other and cause different effects. And there's different, I mean, for certain sort of SMPs, a lot of landscapers or, you know, property owners will have mulch that put in there. Mulch can be a different issue. And when you have mulch, you might have to inspect things a little bit more frequently because when it rains and the mulch can float, it'll clog certain areas. And that's specific to that, to an SMP that have mulch in it. Um, and there's a lot of things too, is that you'll see for the maintenance guidelines that they'll say they're as needed. And that's why when you have things that are as needed, it's very important for the property owner to know exactly what they have installed. Because if it is an as needed item, it's just depending on the site conditions at that point. How much rain is getting into the, how much rain is affecting these SMPs? Is there a lot of sediment debris getting into this when it rains a lot? When it dries out, is there a lot of erosion that is evident and things like that? So you can't just say, oh, we're gonna inspect this place twice a year. We're gonna inspect it four times a year. You have to get a gist of what you have and what the condition is of the site. That way you guys can make a determination to come up with the best maintenance plan possible. So here, if you wanna look at the photos, this is a really big thing for property owners is that maintenance can only do so much. And what we mean by that is you can see throughout here, 
it helps and this isn't always the best case possible but it really helps if you can come up with a plan when you're thinking about maintenance for the other things on your property such as the left here we have a fence that just fell over that's completely completely clogging up this inlet we can't inspect that we can't maintain that and that's going to be an issue so the next picture we have a trash can here that's right next to an inlet and when it rains you can see that that rain is going to flow into that inlet which whatever's in that trash can over time dirt and trash is going to affect that a lot more and it's not the best you know best case in the world we want to pick up our trash can and move somewhere else that's difficult but if we could think about it maybe take some preventative maintenance or inspection utilities to prevent this coming into it in the long term you're going to spend a lot less money on maintenance with this and the other two you can just see these are just very high traffic areas where you're going to see is through inspections certain spots are going to get hit harder than others and so it's something that the property owners are going to have to take into account okay what is getting hit the hardest do we have grease traps that are right next to an inlet grease traps leak all the time one of the worst things in the world is when grease starts getting your inlets can cause a whole load of problems for you so just trying to see what you have on your property, is there a way that we can maneuver different things on the property to make sure we don't have long-term problems or and, reoccurring problems? And before you move on, Ryan, um, besides the accidental um, grease pouring into an inlet from, say, a grease trap or a, a trash can, a lot of times, I'm sure property owners don't, but sometimes their tenants will directly pour grease right. um, or paint. I've seen that a lot with contractors pour, pour paint or leftover concrete um, into inlets. So um, some of it is also, um, you know, knowing the activity that's going on on your property. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I don't want to repeat everything Ryan just said, but, um, you know, the guidelines really should just be a starting point for your maintenance program because they're, they may not necessarily be enough. They may not necessarily address um, all of the conditions that are on your property. Um, and the guidelines themselves, I mean, one of the problems, well, one of the um, challenges with guidelines is that historically there hasn't been a lot of standardization of terminology or that you might just be unfamiliar with the terminology. Um, and maybe it doesn't sound like it applies specifically to your stormwater facility and it may not. So it might require some tweaking. Um, and then I think the only other really important thing uh, to cover with this is, is a schedule. I mean, you can't just set out this maintenance plan and keep it up for a year and a half or the, you know, the first two years or do it just before, you know, that, you know, the township may come in and do an inspection. You really do need to stick to a schedule. Um, yeah, the, the playoff inspection and maintenance is really a snowball effect is where if you know you're only doing things like as needed or if you're not on a good schedule and things build up over time it, it never works out the cost way and just the actual functionality of the stormwater system things can snowball really quickly and that's why looking at the guidelines making a good plan for your own property and keeping on that keeping on that program is extremely important yeah so um Here's, an, here's a real world example of going outside of the maintenance guidelines um, and the requirements for a stormwater structure. This is an inlet that was in a shopping center and um, we found that it would clog very, very quickly um, with trash and debris because that can fit through the, you know, it can fit through a standard grate. The only thing that was required was a sump. Um, and if you're, if you're not familiar with sumps, it's the space below the invert of an outflow pipe. Usually it's a foot to two feet deep where um, when water is inside of the inlet, sediment and debris will settle into that sump rather than going into the outflow pipe. So this already had a sump. It already had a, a trap. And again, terminology, a trap is the same thing as a snout or um, what else do they call it? A trash? Um, trash, trash. trash. Yeah, the, it's the thing that covers the, out, the outflow pipe. So this already met the requirements. We were finding it filled up so quickly that we actually fashioned a, um, a rack um, and put brackets inside the inlet, set the rack on top to catch a lot of trash. So now rather than having to clean out the inlet, bringing in a, a back truck, cleaning out the inlet completely, all you had to do was lift the trash rack and empty it more frequently than um, vacuum cleaning the uh, the the structure itself 
Yeah. So there was, yeah, even though there's a little bit of cost in doing that, um, it saved, you know, the, the cost savings over the long term were, were tremendous. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so here we have living with existing structures. And what we mean by existing structures is this is going to be anything that wasn't new, new, new construction that was just installed, you know, something that was built back in the day. Maybe the property owner just bought this property and they have a lot of existing structures on site and they're not that familiar with it. Or it's just a, over a long period of time living with these existing structures. So right here you can see everything looks decent. Um, these are all older existing structures, as you may be able to tell. From a first glance, everything looks okay. It doesn't look like anything's that wrong. A little bit of sediment. Structurally, it looks decent enough. First glance, it doesn't look too bad. The reason inspections are so important is because when you get to these pictures, which can happen over time, is that existing structures are going to be prone to have a lot more structural damage due to the fact they're existing. So, you know, concrete only has a certain amount of life. As you can see here is that the concrete's eroding away just over time because of water getting to it and slowly corroding it. You also have a lot of bricks. A lot of the existing older structures were bricked up and they don't do that that much anymore. But brick over a lot of time can fall out, fall into the inlet, create a lot of debris inside of the inlet. And then you need to re-brick it, which is we do a lot of parging work is what they call it. And basically you have to get inside the inlet and kind of refabricate it, restructure it to make sure things are okay. So existing structures, you know, they have a longevity to them over a certain period of time. So these can be a little more important to keep a closer eye on them too, because these will, these will cause problems a lot faster, obviously, than new construction because that was just built. So when that happens, I mean, this is probably very familiar to, um, to those of you who have um, larger properties, commercial properties. Uh, inlets tend to, to, to um, <laughs> tend to have a lot of problems. You'll see recessing around an inlet. Um, and you might wonder, do I really need to fix this? So the first picture you can see, the pavement has recessed slightly. So there's probably water ponding there. Water probably seeps through that curb gap right there sits, which then exacerbates the, the condition. Once you have water sitting where you already have recessing, um, that's going to accelerate um, the deterioration of the paving. And then uh, the concrete will fall apart. Um, so what a lot of property owners will do is in the last picture, they might just saw cut around it, um, maybe cut down a foot or so, backfill with concrete and you know, raise it to grade and call it a day. But what you really need to do is look at the interior of the structure and figure out why the problem was, you know, what created the problem? Do you have, is it because the brick and mortar has fallen apart, you know, around the riser level at the top of the structure? Or is it because there's a, a gap where the pipe connects to the structure? Um, is there a lot of seepage in between the structure joints? Or is there a problem with the pipe? Um, next to it. So you make a repair without addressing what the initial problem is, um, it's going to end up, you're going to have to redo it and redo it. And eventually it could be an even bigger problem. Right. And what we talked about in one of the earlier slides, as you can see, sometimes with this concrete on the top of the inlets can erode away or get cracked or damaged if it's in a high traffic area and you have very heavy trucks, trucks constantly driving over it, it can crack it, you know, it can erode away just like this. So, you know, trying to strategically plan out where these stormwaters is, what's happening on your property is really important because some of this could be, some of this could be avoided if, you know, you don't have heavy traffic in this area, as you can see, so you can save money on the long term on that. And during construction, another uh, big cause for, for issues like this is poor compaction. Um, yeah. Yeah, if there was poor compaction to begin with, um, that, you know, you're sure to have, you're sure to develop this type of maintenance. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's why property owners should always try to be the most involved they can be so they can be prepared with the most knowledge possible when they do have to, when they do either they're doing the, the maintenance themselves or if they're hiring somebody else, the more information they have is always going to help out in the long run because you're not going to be able just to see any problems at the ground level at all times and giving it, you know, upfront information about, you know, bad compaction during construction or misinstalled things during construction is always going to make your maintenance program go a lot smoother. And the same is true for um, 
you know, what we call green infrastructure or vegetated infrastructure. Um, over time, it's going to develop, um, it's going to, there, problems are going to be created, especially if you don't keep on top of the maintenance. Infiltration basins, um, retention basins stop infiltrating after a period of time when they're not maintained. Um, and the picture on the bottom there's that it's an outlet structure. Um, you can see it gets overgrown and then you can't access it. And if there were a problem there, you might not even see it for, for a period of time if there's erosion or you've got an issue with the inflow or the outflow. Um, the picture on the right, that's actually um, groundhog infestation ate away at the side of a, a basin slope. Um, the property owner didn't address it, didn't address it. And then all of a sudden a good chunk of the slope just slid, slid down into the basin bottom and they lost two trees with it as well. Um, so it's, it's every bit as important to keep on top of, of green or vegetated infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So why are maintenance and inspection, why are they equally necessary? You can't have inspections without maintenance. You can't have maintenance without inspections. So the inspections are obviously going to identify, um, you know, what are the exact conditions of your property, obviously. And then maintenance is going to be the corrective actions that you do. Each one of them plays off each other because if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, if you lack on your inspections, it's going to snowball into bigger maintenance problems that you're going to have to fix. If you just do inspections and you neglect the maintenance, when the time comes that the municipality, the township, the city comes down to do their inspections, instead of paying a lower cost for an easier fix, you're going to pay an extremely high cost for a one-time fix. Mm -hmm. So just to elaborate, the inspections are a very critical tax. They're at task, they're absolutely necessary. And it's, you know, the inspections are going down there because we want to identify what is actually happening at the property at that time, whether it be, you know, we live in an area where it's four seasons all the way around. So you're going to have it in the summertime where there's heavy rain, it's hotter out, you're going to be more liable for erosion. It's going to happen a lot quicker. In the wintertime, you're going to have um, the snow right here where they're going to be plowing trucks in your parking lot. A huge thing that we see a lot of time is that plow trucks will knock these grates out. They'll knock out the concrete. That's something that inspections can identify if the property owner misses it. And, you know, we can catch say, hey, listen, you know, this looks like this might happen during a snowstorm. So the right that we have over here, we have a trash rack that's completely filled up with debris. And this is something that we would note and say, okay, well, this is an issue. We need to clear this out because this could slow the water pace down, the flow to it, and it could cause problems down the line. So inspections is like your base guideline. You want the inspections to be your base guideline to show a, how is this my stormwater functioning? B, do we have to do maintenance to it? So the types of things that you're going to note in an inspection, um, you know, the first is the sediment and debris level inside of any subsurface structures that you have. Um, and that's, you, that's how you'll determine when and if you need to, to clean them out. And if you don't, then of course you could, they could lead to clogging and failure. Um, the second is a picture of, um, the curb behind an inlet, so a, um, a, a C top a curb um, inlet. When you have recessing behind it, it can happen on the pavement side. It can also happen behind it. Um, and you can, as soon as you see that kind of recessing or sinkhole forming, um, you know you want to investigate further, figure out why. Um, don't ignore the downspouts. You need to take a look at, you know, that's part of managing the stormwater on the property is making sure that whatever's coming off the roof is making it into the stormwater facility. And that includes um, downspouts. Um, and then you want to you want to measure things. If you've got a small sinkhole um, that maybe has been there, could be existing. You definitely want to measure it. Um, any kind of um, any, anywhere that you can assign. Um, what, what am I trying to say here? Any, anywhere you can quantify. Um, you know what what the maintenance task, what the maintenance items are. You, you want to do that so that over time you'll know whether or not it's something you can continue to monitor or it's something that's progressing and you need to take care of it. Yeah, you know, it's it, pretty common. If you see something, you know, you, we, want, we want pictures, we want to write it down, we want to see what it's at. You know, if you see um, the second picture where, and by recessing, we just mean like if you see like ponding or standing water where it really shouldn't be. Right. If you see there are like a hole that's kind of like, you know, that's not supposed to be there. It looks like it was unnaturally formed or something. You want to monitor it a little bit because the first glance would be like, okay, well, this doesn't look too bad. And then two months later, we look at it and it's, it's growing bigger and bigger and bigger over time. 
That's why inspections, you just nip that in the butt before it becomes a bigger problem than what it actually has to be. And that's one of the reasons that we, we stress um, a photo location when you're doing inspections um, or when your provider is doing inspections. When you take a picture from the exact same spot, it gives you the ability to track, some, track conditions over time. Um, believe it or not, this is, the, this is the same spot and it looks quite different um, before maintenance, after maintenance, after a storm. Um, and you know, one of the other strengths in that, and one of the biggest strengths is to know whether or not you need to perform maintenance or it's something you can continue to monitor. It hasn't changed at all. Um, it may also highlight a new condition that you didn't notice before. You know, if all of a sudden you see something, you can go, wait a minute, was that there before? And you can go back and look and see. Um, it's very valuable. Um, and it'll help you to plan for uh, budget budgeting uh, yeah. for maintenance. You can see how long it takes for something to develop before you have to take care of it. So it's very helpful in that way as well. Absolutely. I mean, Hamilton Township has been um, proactive in trying to help property owners to do just that, to um, record the same things every time they do an inspection, to document them in such a way that it, um, well, one that it's easy for township officials to read and keep track of as well, but also the property owner, um, including like a you know a summary of the findings. Not everyone's going to read an entire report. They want to know you know the gist of of what was discovered during that inspection, if anything. Yeah. Um, so they the township does have um, a template uh, that I'm, I assume was provided to all of you, and if not, definitely reach out to them and get a copy of the template so that you'll know what you you know, what you want to make sure that you see every single time you go out and do an inspection. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So communicating with the township, it's pretty simple. It's just that we're all on one team here. We all want the same thing. We all want everything to be in compliance at the same time. We don't want issues. We want low budget costs to do all the maintenance. We don't, you know, we don't want anybody to have to spend a lot of money out of their pocket. And the best way to have a good relationship to have the best storm water problem is be proactive and communicate with the township. You know, the township doesn't want you to not be in compliance. You know, they don't want you to have, you know, all these problems all over everything. You communicate with them shows a lot that you're going forward trying to do your stormwater maintenance and identify everything as possible. Inspections is a huge key. As we as Kate just talked about in the slide previous, they already released that to, to everybody to do your inspections and note everything. Well, if you're proactive and noting everything and you're and you're doing everything on time the right way and just you know have a good maintenance plan in place, just communicating and being upfront with them and telling them how it is is just absolutely beneficial and keeps everybody happy, everybody one team, everybody on the same page. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what to expect with maintenance. So these are a bunch of maintenance activities that we have here. To the left um, is just actually preventative maintenance structure. You put that on top of the, or, I'm sorry, you take the inlet grate off and then you install this in. And basically what the, all that does is gonna catch all the trash and debris. So you can just lift that out and you can dump it out and clean it out instead of having to back it out. On the middle, we have a vac truck that's cleaning out a trench drain. The vac truck is gonna be one of the biggest things for maintenance activities because it's um, the primary way we're gonna clean most of the things out if we don't have to take in more extreme measures. And to the right, we have leaves being bagged up that were debris, causing debris, sediment, and a bunch of... Which is really important um, in the fall. Right. Because in the fall, obviously, when the leaves are falling and everything like that, leaves are biodegradable, obviously. So over time, they'll turn into, you know, silt sediment that could sit at the bottom of the basin. Do you think we'll get money from Home Depot for that? Thing? For, the plug, for, the, for the plug that we just gave him? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I wish. So the left is what I talked about, the back truck. The vac truck for all the inlets that we keep on talking about, outlet structures, manholes, is going to be the way you're going to clean out your structures. They have all different kinds of vac trucks, tow behinds, high-tech vac trucks, combo trucks with jetters in them. They're the number one way that you're going to be able to clean out your inlets because we've been there before. You don't want to do it by hand. You don't want to do the five-gallon buckets jumping in there trying to scoop up all the dirty stuff that's in these inlets. Not to mention in a structure that's deeper than four feet or four feet, you need um, confined space equipment. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have to be OSHA certified and um, 
yep. Dawn confined space. Yeah, so it's yeah. just a better idea to get a back truck in there. Yeah, and then if you yeah if you go on that road, then you're going to find a very limited amount of contractors that have all that to be able to form like a confined space to get in there. That companies are very good in just going in, cleaning everything out. They take the pictures before and after, so you have a good documentation of the maintenance that was done, which is like you know, it'll look like an inspection document, but it would just be for the maintenance for it. So you have a clear list that you can present to the township. This is what I have on the property. This is what I was cleaned out. We have also here, we have a trash rack and a trash rack is going to prevent any trash, debris, anything like that getting inside the pipe. So it's something you would just install, you would just drill it into the side of the pipe and that would just cover everything going in here. And so the next one we have is what Kate talked about. We have a lot of recessing around the in, uh, inlets. Even, yeah, even in the grass. Yep. And that would be, so what we're doing is we're just fixing the grade so that the water does it, so the water can go into the inlet properly and that we're correcting the erosion around it. You know, you're just hand tampering it. You're gonna put topsoil down, seed and mat to make sure it's good. And another thing that's important too, is after you do a lot of these maintenance activities, you definitely wanna do that follow-up inspection to see once you completed a maintenance task like this, how is it working in the future? And to the right, we just have simple, plant, uh, simple planting. You know, a lot of for these vegetated things, when like Kate talked about overgrowth a lot, you're gonna to have to take a lot of overgrowth out, but you're also gonna to have to have plants sometimes too. And that's what Kate also talked about too, is that if you guys have the plans for what you have on the property, a lot of times they will have a list of what, is, what the plants that are supposed to be installed. And that'll help you determine, do I have the right kind of plants in here or this is an invasive species that I have to get rid of? And that makes it very easy too, is when you have to do this maintenance task, you can order the plants, we can, the contractor can get you the plants to plant them right there because they're just noted right there. All right, so on the left, we see this a lot. This is a high traffic inlet. And it just, when heavy water comes down, a lot of the sticks, leaves, big log, as you can see there, will pile on top of it. So it's something that just needs to be cleaned off the top of it. Obviously, you're gonna wanna look inside the inlet and see how much actually got into there. But this is a very common thing that we see. And it's also something that a property owner can take a very good proactive thing to do, do themselves. You know, they can clean this up. They can put it in the bag and put it in uh, the brown bags, like we showed you before, and take this off of the inlet without having to spend a lot of money for someone to come down there and do it themselves. What we have here is a, a filter clean and reinstall is a lot of these, um, some of these underground structures have a jellyfish or they have a filter system with a vault where to have a life expense on them, usually it's about four to five years or three to five years, I believe. And you have to do inspections on them. And after that, you have to replace the filters. This can get a little bit more tricky and it's this isn't a recommended maintenance uh, task. This would be a required one because after a certain amount of time, you go half, you're gonna have to replace these, which is why you should know what you have on your property. Because if you have something like this, you are gonna have to do this at some point. And it's a little bit um, more meticulous. You have to be certified to take these out. You have to be certified to take them away. You have to clean them out, wrap them in a certain kind of plastic. There's a little bit of trickiness to them, which is why, like I said, it's very important to know if you have something like this. It can, um, you can call a manufacturer, like Kate said, they have really good, good guidelines on how to take care of things like that. Like I said, I go buy a jellyfish, a vault with filters in them, They'll, it'll be very well noted on your construction plans if you have them. There'll probably be a couple pages dedicated just to that to show you how they work. So it's something you should look out for. Here we have a, a missing grate and we have also an orifice to the left that you install a trash rack for. So something we would do here is that we would correct the no grate problem. We would put maybe like a, a top of concrete on that to create a balance on it. And then we would install a trash rack to it. So it's someone just taking measurements to start getting proposals together to how to do that. And to the right, if you know during all the snowstorms, all those plastic uh, things that they put up all across the property, they always fall into these inlets. Like every time we see them, they always fall into there. And it's just something to note. Um, they had to be cleaned out. This would have to be removed, you know, to get out of there. It's just a typical, typical maintenance task. So more of them we have here <laughs> is a lot of, uh, this is just sediment leaves and um, you can't really, you can barely see it, but on the left side in the corner here, there is a pipe that's actually there. And my good friend Kay here actually had to crawl her way through there to access this pipe <laughs> at the time, but they definitely get dirty. The maintenance tasks definitely get dirty at some point. It's not the most glorious things to do all the time. Smelly. Smelly, not good. You're definitely dirty at the end of the day. But something like this, we have to clean all that out. You know, it's a major backup on a pipe right here that's causing, you know, which is from neglect. This is just from neglect, not taking care of your property over a lot of amount of years. This will build up to something extreme like this, but then has to be removed. 
something not as common, but it's definitely getting more common is this is a green roof. And a green roof is it sits on top of a property and they have the liner and certain kind of uh, rocks that will infiltrate and that will go out and maybe, you know, down downspouts or have you not. They usually have a liner on them underneath that have to be checked, that have to be looked at every now and then. So it's really, this is for green roofs especially, is getting with the contractor or on the site plans of what these were installed, they'll have really good maintenance guidelines on how often you should be looking at this, how often you should be replacing things on it, because this is a little bit more reticulate. And to the right here, we just have a pipe here. Uh, what we do is a lot of jetting. And so a jetting is an extremely big hose. This is an extremely big hose that goes inside of the pipe that's gonna have a high pressure system that's gonna pull sediment out of the pipe so we can back it out. And that's the best way you're gonna be able to clear a pipe. You can also see in the picture here is that around there's new concrete installed is because this pipe was corroding away at the sides as concrete was getting really bad. So we came in here, we can brick that up and you put uh, hydraulic cement. And it's also, like I said, hydraulic cement is good to know for whoever's doing it is hydraulic cement is water sealed tight. Everything that you're doing in these inlets, you have to think about water is going to affect this. So you have to put in the right materials that's going to be waterproof. And we have more. There's still more. We still have more. <laughs> what you're going to see a lot, especially in Hamilton Township, that we've come across a lot, a lot of riprap. A lot of riprap. Riprap is going to be your best friend, which is this stone that you see over here onto the left and to the right. Over time, riprap will get clogged up and there will be sediment that forms in it. And that's why you have to note this during inspections. How is this riprap functioning? Does it look okay? Is it ponding in any areas? Is there anything that's unusual about it? Is it getting tossed around? Is it, is it forming in one spot where it shouldn't be? Is there a heavy flow? Is it eroding on the sides? All just different things to look about. And the things that you would do about this is maybe you have to refresh it. And refreshing it is, in, is, a, is a low cost thing for the most part is where you come down there and you kind of mix it all around, refresh it, lift it up, so it's not getting buried into the ground after rain. And what you can see over here, you have corrosion, you have a lot of sediment that's just forming, which would have to be fixed. Sometimes you even have to check the grade to make sure that the grade's still on so the water's flowing the way it's supposed to. And before you move on, um, so the thing about riprap is what it's used for is two things. One is to pick up sediment and debris. So if you've got a curb cut out, you should have riprap beyond it. And um, part of its function is to pick up all of that before it goes into a stormwater facility. So it's doing its job. That's not a problem, but it does need to be cleaned out periodically. The other purpose of riprap is that it's um, an energy dissipator. It slows the velocity of water before it enters the facility. So if it's really clogged, it's, it can no longer function that way because the water no longer has to run through um, these little channels between the rocks um, to make its way down and it will flow on top. It'll just get sheet flow. Um, so that's, that's, that's the reason it, to keep on top of that, keep on top of riprap. All right. So for budgeting for maintenance, obviously one of the biggest things, how are we all going to pay for this? Now, if we talked about this before, it really depends on your property and what you have in there, because all the maintenance tax that we all just went through are specific to different kinds of stormwater on your property. If you have a very high traffic area that gets dirty a lot, then the budget is gonna be a little bit more compared to a low traffic area where nothing goes into it. Um, there's different than um, when you're refreshing riprap or you're doing anything in a vegetated area where you're dealing with maybe planting or just fixing some soil or erosion, it's gonna be completely different when you have an underground system like you see here where you have to get in there with a vac truck and you have to clean everything out over a certain period of time compared to also filters where you have a mandated requirement after a certain period of time, you have to do a maintenance yeah. tax. The thing, the picture on the right-hand side um, actually came from a property in New Jersey, but not in Hamilton Township. Um, a property in New Jersey where the property owner wasn't even aware that they had three subsurface vaults that had these filters installed in them. Um, they'd actually called us in to do an inspection of the property and they thought it was just the bioretention basin at the back of the property. But of course, when we were opening manholes and looking around, we found these three vaults and they were completely filled with sediment and debris um, because they, they weren't aware and their township was not on top of um, doing inspections and requiring maintenance um, at that point. So what we did with them was we chunked it out. Um, they didn't have it in their budget to have this entire vault cleaned out and all the filters replaced. So we did um, one vault at a time over the course of three years. Yeah, yeah and you have in-house capabilities here is 
a couple slides prior we saw where there was a bunch of sticks and things on top of an inlet. Anything that's not intrusive of cleaning out like a vault like this or, you know, that kind of in depth, if you can do it in house, absolutely perform it in house. You guys have the templates for the inspections that Hamilton Township has on the website or however they're going to be able to get that to you. If there's certain little things that you can see that you can fix, absolutely keep it in house, keep your costs down. You know, you not all the time you're going to have to have a contractor come down and do it. You know, one of the things we're doing this for is to educate property owners so they don't have to burden the cost of always having to call somebody to come out. Right. And if you don't have the facility staff or you're not comfortable doing all the inspections, I would look for a, a maintenance company that's going to be flexible with you. Maybe they come in and do one inspection per year, two per year, and then you have your facilities people doing inspections in between. Um, so when, when looking for a maintenance provider, think about what it is that, um, you know, that, that you can do and what you need them to do. And if they're not flexible with you, may, maybe you need to keep, keep um, shopping. Right. Yeah. And yeah, just, just to reiterate what Kate said, it can be as simple as, hey, we have a couple areas on our property that get hit a little bit harder than others. So you maybe have one person just take a peek at it, just take a regular picture just to keep tabs on it so nothing ever mm -hmm. progresses to the point where you have to come up with a lump sum of money to fix a bigger problem for an area that gets heavy traffic. Well, finally, just thought one other thing. Oh, We've just started um, what's essentially a new offering, and that is um, training facilities employees to do the maintenance. So we have a couple of contracts where, you know, they don't know a whole lot about the stormwater facilities that are installed, how to inspect them, how to clean them out. And so when we do inspections, they tag along and we're training them um, with what it is they need to look for and, and how they can perform, if not all, at least some of the maintenance um, in-house. Yeah. And, and we thought this was going to be great, too, because of the fact that if we have the property owners engaging, being more educated about it, the communication with the township is only going to grow from that. You know, the, the more the less times you have to go to the middleman, which would be the contractor to get things back and forth to go to the township, can sometimes be a little bit of a blurb. Can't be sometimes not the smoothest thing in the world. Having the property owner and the staff on there being trained at least a little bit to do the inspections is always going to keep that one big happy family together. Okay. Yeah, so when you don't perform regular maintenance, um, uh, the, the far left picture was actually a pipelining um, project that we had to do. They had um, one of those old corrugated metal pipes um, installed from their outlet structure to the street inlet. And when they saw that there was minor um, corrosion, didn't do anything about it, didn't do anything about it. And eventually the whole bottom rotted out. And then they had to um, line the entire length of it rather than doing some um, a, a lesser um, uh, a lesser repair to the pipe. The one in the middle is um, just sediment and debris that's built up inside a pipe in the way older structures and older uh, stormwater facilities were constructed. A lot of times there isn't great access for maintenance um, that you can't get, um, you can't jet from one manhole to the next and vacuum it out. And you, it can only be done manually. So then you're sending guys down there in harnesses with, um, um, with air tanks to manually drag a hose through there. Mm -hmm. Very costly because it's time consuming. It's a confined space. Right, expensive. which you we know, try to avoid at yeah, all costs. It can, be, it can be dangerous work too, especially with existing structures and you don't know the integrity of it, you know, and that's how costs can build up quickly. Right. I keep saying it all the time, but it, it's the snowball effect. Right. If you see it a little bit, it's not going to be as much as if you just let it go and you ignore it to the point where that's going to be a lot of money. As far as I know, in the foreseeable future, it's not going to stop raining. So if you see a problem, the rain's not going to stop and the problem's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. Hey, here we go. Well, that about wraps it up for us, guys. Does anyone have any questions? Great job, uh, Brian, Kate. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. No other questions, guys? Thank you. Thank you. We're sleeping. <laughs> All right. All right. See no questions. Um, like I said, thank you, uh, Kate and Ryan. Um, I hope everyone found it informative.
And like always, if there's any questions or concerns, you, you give me a call or email me. Sure, everyone has my email and phone number. Um, just in case, I'll put my email into the chat. My email into the chat. Yes, thank you for doing this, Tim. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, guys. Well, if thank that's you. it, um, again, thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be able to talk to you about Stormborn presenting it. And um, I hope you guys found it informative. Yeah, thank you. And happy Friday. Yeah, enjoy the weekend, everybody. Happy Friday. Have a good weekend. All right. See you. Take care.